we now have our round table discussion. I would like to ask Tony Fincham, Faisal McDardy and Richard Franklin to take their places at the front, socially distanced of course, while we have a major discussion on whether the trumpet major is major or minor. Thank you to everybody that handed in a question. I think the best way to go to kick us off for this um, session, which will be relatively short, is I want one sentence from each speaker at the front here, giving their opinion of the novel. Is it a lesser novel? Is it major or minor? Richard. Yeah, I I do think uh, that it is um, a lesser uh, novel. I think of the lesser novels, though, I would judge it to be uh, one of the more important. I suppose you could say it was the the most major of the minor novels. So I rather like that, the more major of the minor novels. After this morning's talk, I think it's clear that I regard it as a serious work of art, um, and therefore it's a major novel. And Tony? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about this division into major and minor. I, I think it is a complex work. I mean, I'll go along with a lot of what Faisal said earlier. I mean, I think Hardy didn't achieve what he was trying to achieve, but he was probably trying to achieve the impossible by melding all the historical details that fascinated him and that subsequently went into the dinners into a a fairly atypical Hardy in love story because it's usually, uh, you know, one man after three women or or the other way around. (laughs) This is quite different. Yes, definitely. Right, so now I'll read out some of your questions. And they're all anonymous, so don't worry, I'm not going to point and laugh at anybody. As an overlooked novel, do you think it's time that the trumpet major would suit dramatising in a film or a drama series for TV? What do you think, Faisal? It, it, is, it has been a, a largely neglected novel. Um, it was at one point, as you, some of you might know, um, an O-level GCE textbook um, and consequently at the time it was treated fairly seriously within the classroom um, and taken fairly seriously I'm a little uncomfortable if I may with the designation of works as being lesser or greater and so on we do this purely as an academic exercise I go to any novel or any poem because I enjoy them pure and simple and there isn't an academic work on earth that's going to tell me that David Copperfield is not the greatest novel I've ever read. Regardless, it's, it, it, it's first and foremost a personal reaction. Now, therefore, within the context of the trumpet major, enjoying it, actually understanding what Hardy is trying to do, appreciating Hardy's language, which I believe is beautiful in this novel, and accepting all those five things I brought this morning, talked about this morning, being melded together to create a new form of reality within the novel, accepting its shortcomings as you articulated, and as Mike Irwin articulates when he says it's got stereotypes in it and it begins to go a bit awry in the last few chapters, uh, as, as a farce often might do, it is still, at the end of the day, an extremely enjoyable piece of work and consequently would be, could be beautifully produced as a serious work with moments of humour. Yes. Thank you, Faisal. Now, I absolutely adore this one, and I think Tony should field it. Does anyone else find Anne infuriating <laughs> when she cannot make up her mind between her three suitors? OK, I was, I was thinking about the last question, actually. I thought we were all going to get that. Um, but, oh, listen, can I just say about the theatrical thing? There have been productions, uh, I mean, apart from the New Hardy Players, mm. um, there was a production, a musical of it in London not that long ago, which I, I've got, you know, it's published as a book. I, I've got the script of that. Um, yeah, I think Anne, Anne is a bit infuriating and somewhat atypical for a Hardy and heroine in, the, in that she can't make her mind up. And in fact, I must admit, when I reread it before this, I'd forgotten that, um, that Bob was promised to her in the end, or that's what was supposed to happen, because I don't think one really believes it is going to happen. It, it, it is atypical of Hardy. Um, usually his women um, you know, settle on somebody and then it's a disaster. Um, the, 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 this one doesn't. 
I, I, I don't find her one of one of his clearest portraits of of a woman. And I mean, if, you know, he's usually very sensitive to um, female feelings, as as obviously Tess being perhaps the best example. And he doesn't really seem to be under the skin of this one. But then, as it, as Faisal pointed out at the beginning of the book, we're we're looking at something that's set in the past, that's set in a different age, in a different world, mm. and maybe that's part of it. Yeah. May I very briefly? Uh, Hardy at one point tells us youth is foolish, and it's his way of protecting or defending uh, the fact that Anne Garland can't make a decision. And when she does make a decision, the decision implied by Hardy is the wrong one. And he actually puts it down to youth is foolish. Well, we know that youth is foolish. And we know that for a fact. We've all made mistakes in our youth that we now cringe to think about. The other one is that Anne Garland, uh, much as she may find it difficult to make up her mind, is quite a gutsy woman. Uh, her escape from Festus in the cottage, her escape on Champion, uh, her ability to get away from him when he falls face flat into the water, all of these sort of slightly pantomimic moments. She, as a woman, actually stands up for herself in a remarkable way. Uh, but at the same time, yes, it is true, she finds it very difficult to make up her mind, and I put that down to the time rather than anything else. Can, can I say one further bit on that? I mean, she reminds me a bit of Vikram Seth's A Suitable yes. Boy, which was on yes. television recently, because really, it, I mean, the, the heroine of that doesn't really want to be found a suitable boy. She wants to <laughs> wants to get on with her life and be independent. And I think, to some extent, although all these men keep coming round Anne and she doesn't seem to have any other role than to be married off, it isn't really what she wants. No, it's not. Good point. I, yes, I think the, I mean, the, the image of the weather vane, of course, is, is significant, that this variability about her is, uh, is, you know, almost the essence of her character. And uh, I, I think that there are people who are like that. Uh, so I, although there are, there, there's a negative side to her characterization, I think that, you know, Hard is envisioning the kind of person who could exist or could have existed. So I think that's important to note that. I think other characters are also flawed in various ways, aren't they? I mean, John is flawed too. I mean, he's sort of um, dull, basically, <laughs> you know. Um, and um, I think that, uh, you know, obviously Bob has clearly flawed. You know, people, you've said that, Faisal. Well, so, he's sorry. the subject of this next question, actually, which I was going to direct to you anyway, Richard. Oh, right. <laughs> How fair do you think critics have been to the character of Bob Loveday? Hmm. Well, I think pretty, pretty fair, really. Um, you know, I, obviously he's not as gross a character as Festus, uh, ever so exciting though he is, as you pointed out. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, he's certainly a sort of character who um, one tends to agree with Leslie Stephen that, you know... Um, uh, she married the wrong man, or she was set up to marry the wrong man. Um, and a sensible choice would have been John, and not this uh, sort of, you know, character who was, you know, with Matilda and then with a the blonde lady in Portsmouth and whatnot. And Roger yeah. and a Royster. Absolutely, yeah, that's right. And Aurora and a puker. <laughs> um, this one I'd like to direct to Tony uh, because of his uh, expertise in Hardy's topography. I think this, this would be quite well answered by you, Tony, if you don't mind. Sure. Would you agree that the novel, whilst using the Victorian conventions of melodrama and a love triangle, is actually essentially a text about place? Mm. <laughs> um, you, you floored me there a bit. Uh, <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, well, Hardy, Hardy when he tied them the whole lot together in the sort of West Wessex edition made sure that they, they were all descriptions of different parts of his um, uh, special landscape. Um, I mean, I, again, I take Faisal's point that really the vast amount of it is set in, set in and around the mill. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. And I mean, I think actually I was looking at that, Hardy, that old Hardy Society bit of um, publication, the guide, you know, go out in your car and visit these different places. And, 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 it, and it isn't, it, I mean, obviously overcome it probably primarily certain points, but there's also a, a, lot, of, a lot of features of Upway, which yeah. that doesn't yeah. seem to emphasize very much. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, the, the, there's all the description of the downs, but I mean, that, that also comes in the Melody Hazar. Um, 
so sorry, I don't feel I'm answering the question. But no, no, you have actually, because you've pointed out all the, the, the importance of the particular places, as did Andrew and Mark in their talk, yeah. the importance of place in the novel, which uh, I agree with the asker of that question, is quite often left by the wayside because people only think of Anne and her three boys. Mm. So but it's also, it, it, it's also a very constrained novel in terms of place. It's the mill, basically. Yes. And anything else tends to be either reported to us, such as the Battle of Trafalgar and so on and so forth, or little visits to Budmouth or to Captain Hardy. Mm-hmm. And going back, if I may, with your permission, mm-hmm. going back to the character of uh, uh, Robert Loveday, he is presented within the context of what you spoke about, the alpha male. He is a hero of the Battle of Trafalgar. He helps Captain Hardy when he's injured. He then jumps onto the French ship and fights valiantly and therefore gets a promotion. All of these things are there. So technically, as a person, he's a little bit more than a stereotype. He's, he's, he's quite three-dimensional, but only in a reported way. That keeps happening in the novel. We get told things. Uh, and uh, by the way, the kind of coincidental, fortuitous appearance of a sailor coming back to tell the family all about the great Robert Hardy's heroism uh, is, 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 is a very clumsy device, but it works. It's a theatrical device. Somebody comes in, gives us the information we need, a bit like Shakespeare when in Macbeth we don't actually witness the battle or in Julius Caesar. We, wit- we hear a description of it when Brutus says, what's happening? And, and he's told what's happening. And it, because we can't have it on the, on the scene. The same with this novel. We can't have it on the scene. We're not in, 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 on, on, on the, the victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. We are actually in a very small, contained place. Mm-hmm. So there is a complexity to it in, in an odd kind of way. Rather clumsy at times, I admit. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I went on too long. No, I just wanted to say that I think the novel occupies an interesting and important position in terms of the evolution of of Hardy's thinking about Wessex. Um, Because uh, Wessex isn't just a geographical entity, it's also an historic entity. Um, And I think he's thinking back... To, to you know the formation of this idea, and you know you can go back as far as the end of the 18th century, um, and, and you know there is there he's think, still thinking about Wessex. He, he's not going any further back, uh, but you know at least that's that's part of the formation of this this firm idea of Wessex, which is so important as time goes on yes. in his writing. Yes. Now. Here's a question for you, and I would like an answer from all three of you, please. Is it fair for Andrew Hewitt to approach Hardy's commemorative view of the history with the eyes of the Black Lives Matter attitudes of today? Very interesting question. Tony, would you like to have a first go at that one? Um... Well, it was interesting to hear a completely different approach to... And I, I, well, I praised Farsa's lecture at the time, and uh, there are different ways of looking at things. I do worry about um, political correctness and critical theory creeping too far into our understanding of Hardy. Um, I actually... Uh, Andrew talked about the narrowness of the intellectual scope of the novel, and I thought perhaps you're looking in the mirror, Andrew, when you said that. <laughs> uh, have I said enough? <laughs> Uh, The answer to that one as to whether it's fair or not is to to a large extent yes and no. Very briefly, as a yes, it's perfectly acceptable within the context of today to look at the past and say, well, actually, with what I know now, with what I understand now, with the developments we've made, hopefully for the better, not always I know, I can see that that was wrong, if, if that makes sense. I personally don't think that actually it takes away from the enjoyment of the great literature, because if it were to do so, there's a huge swathe of it that flies out of the window, and I'm not willing to have that under any circumstances. And therefore, I go to the other side, too, and I say, no, it's not really fair, because if it were to be seen as purely a fair response, then we wouldn't read Dickens, because he was a racist. We wouldn't, we wouldn't read a great number of works, uh, because they were, at the time, 
perfectly all right in today's world, they give you a kind of cringe factor. So you suspend your disbelief and say it doesn't matter within that context. Maybe if it were happening right before my eyes today, I would be shocked. The attitude to women in the trumpet major is really quite repulsive because woman is spoken of purely as a, prop- as a piece of property. Well, actually, at the time, yes, she was. She was chattel. She was her husband's chattel, pure and simple. That within that context, the way they speak is normal. I find it offensive, but then I'm living in the year 2020, and I, don't, I really can't stand that talk because I immediately think, for example, of my daughter, and I say, no, this is not on. But within the context of the novel, I can suspend my disbelief and say it's perfectly all right. I know I'm being ambiguous, but I'm not. I'm giving you two contexts. So I can listen to Andrew on the one hand and think, yes, I understand what you're saying. I understand fully what you're getting at. But at the same time, from the point of view of the enjoyment of the novel itself, in essay, I find find what you're saying terribly irritating. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I tend to agree with uh, what um, uh, both... uh, others have said but um, but I, in one sense I don't think it altogether matters because I think as Faisal said this morning the sense in which this novel is historic or historical um, well I don't think it is a particularly historical I think in a sense it fails as far as it, uh, being a historical novel is concerned because and, and this was brought out when, when we were thinking of, were looking at that sort of the portrayal of it in drama, it is almost timeless in a sense. You know, that sort of harlequinade uh, element of the novel. I don't, I mean, although it's set in the Napoleonic era, it doesn't need to be set in the Napoleonic era. It could be set in any era. Uh, you know, this sort of, um, uh, you know, I just, I just think that if it succeeds, it succeeds almost independent of that particular historic setting. Yes, yes, agreed. Uh, We've got one here. um, Was the trumpet major written by Hardy as an exercise to write about his interest in the military and men and manoeuvres? Might this be the true... uh, I can't quite read it, but might this be the true reason for the weak characterisation of Anne to, in fact, support the male characters to show um, the true importance, unlike most of his other works where the females are foregrounded, of course. Um, What would you say about that, Richard? Well, I mean, I think Hardy was obviously very interested in military things. Uh, he took great interest in them. I mean, he was fascinated, uh, you know, at the time of the Boer War, for example, and what was going on militarily and so forth, in spite of the fact that he had no affection for war. Um, and one of, the, one of the questions is whether, uh, in the course of the trumpet major, uh, he adequately brings out um, the, the negative side... Uh, of the the, 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 the the sadnesses and, and the grimness uh, of war. Mm. I mean, he does try to, you know, so that, you know, you have this sort of, like, you know, great military display and so forth, and then you have reference to the battles and so forth. Um, uh, Andrew used a, a, a curious, what he called proleptic anamnesis when he was talking about that, when you're sort of trying to sort of think ahead you know, to what would happen And he to does that people. quite a few times in the novel, yeah, where he yeah. takes us forward yeah, w- yeah, within the context yeah. of the time of the novel yeah. and tells you about somebody who's going to die. I don't know whether he does that sufficiently and adequately, but it's certainly what he's attempting to. Yeah. Reading the novel often makes me still now think of the, the, the dynasts uh, and, and the whole uh, much more serious work, if I could call it that, a major work, if you want, where the, there is a representation of uh, military affairs and human affairs. That's the whole point. It, that was, that's, in, that's memorable. It really is. It, it, it's a wonderful work. And I know that Hardy himself thought very highly of it. Um, it might be a difficult work to read in the sense of pure length of it, and the fact that at times you feel like you're going on a bit, my friend, but it, 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 did, it doesn't matter because it actually works. I think it's here in this novel too, the human connection to war. 
I'm, I'm not claiming it succeeds because I agree with Richard, it doesn't fully succeed. I think somehow the military bed get, gets subsumed too much within the stroke love angle, the human bit, the character bit, the accuracy bit, all of these things, and the craft of writing the novel, in other words, interferes occasionally. Yeah. I'm but sorry, I... No, no. Um, I, I, well, for, well, I should... Following on from what, what Feist was saying, really, I mean, I mean, I think when we're talking, about, going back to our original thing about major and minor, I mean, this is a sort of preface or prelude to the dinners because yeah. Hardy did regard the dinners as his major work. It, it's never re- really been appreciated as such. Although I would certainly, in fact, I think I said in my chairman's notes before last that uh, something to do in lockdown is read it, and yes. I've done that in yeah. under 24 hours uh, on the third time I read it. I think so. It's quite possible. It, I mean, it, it is a wonderful work, and I, and I think you know he was getting his head around the ideas and a lot of the things which came up more successfully in the dinners, he was starting on here, and at the same time obviously producing a novel, I presume this was for serial publication, I can't remember, but it probably was like all the others, you know, which, yes, which it was, was to start with. which, yes, was, yes, to, which yes. was to earn his bread and butter which he needed to do yeah. mm-hmm. There's one last question here uh, How does grandfather is there in the dynasts and in the return of the native, where is he in the trumpet major, and which of the fencibles is he anyway? Um, <laughs> I'm wondering, is the grandfather figure Festus's uncle that he keeps trying to find the money off? Uncle Benji. No, I don't. What, Uncle Benji, then? Perhaps. I don't know, but do you three have any thoughts about that one? No, Uncle Benji comes across very, or Benjamin comes across very much as obviously the miser, and he reminds me of mm. Grand Day by, by Balzac. Where it is a miser who also has a huge amount of pathos. He's, he's quite a sad character. He's not just purely a miser. He, he's lonely, he's frightened, he's insecure, and he's probably severely depressed and he can't stand his nephew. Under, uh, uh, is it his nephew, his grandson? Is it? No, his nephew, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, partly understandably. But whether there's a connection between that and the kind of biographical background, I can't find any, to be honest. I, I think it's unlikely that there is, and I think you were mentioning in, in your talk about um, the chivalric code and um, the fact that Festus was undermining that. I mean, I think Hardy was undermining uh, the, 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 the yeomanry in the same way the poor man, the lady, his first novel was undermining the aristocracy, and, and that, that is a continuing theme in Hardy. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was part, part of that as much as anything, yeah. anything else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, just before we finish, uh, what I did uh, ahead of the day was um, some of you are already uh, members, please do all join if you're on Facebook at all we have a group called uh, Thomas Hardy Fans and what I did was I put out a question I think it was last week and I said about us having this study day, about us having this round table discussion and I said I personally love it and think that the character of Festus Derriman is a creation of comic genius I would be very grateful if you would care to leave your own comments so that I can collect the information and share it on the day. And none of these people are academics or have vested interests in Hardy armour. Uh, These are people who just love reading Hardy, and they're just literally fans of Thomas Hardy. And we had, I like the trumpet major because it's a lot of fun, the perfect rejoinder to those who accuse Hardy of being an unrelieved gloomster. <laughs> it shares with Under the Greenwood Tree the rare distinction among his novels of having no tragic occurrences, unless you count the last sentence as such, which I don't really. Um, <laughs> don't tell me the names of these people, but, uh, um, I share your view of Festus Derriman and the passage where he's leading the charge against the invasion he knows hasn't occurred always has me in stitches. Ditto the drilling scene outside the church, Dad's army, with the enemy being Napoleon rather than Hitler. I have an idea how he adapted this scene from elsewhere, but can't recall the details, and I can't explain why it's a neglected novel. Is it overshadowed by the famed notoriety of his later tragic novels? Uh, We then have somebody who has been present here today, uh, in the group said, I like the trumpet major for the way Hardy combines real history with real life locations we can still see today. As Tony was commenting, Weymouth, the Derrimans Oxwell Hall, the Mill at Sutton Points, for example. Perhaps my two favourite bits are the historically accurate account of George III bathing 
with his band, a group of four of them, with fiddles, real and cellos, sorry, a trombone and a drum, in an adjacent bathing machine while playing the national anthem whenever he raises his head above the water. <laughs> and the review of the troops on the fields near Osmington. George III, Prince Frederick Augustus, the Duke of York, the Princess Mary, Sophia and Amelia, and General Garth of Islington House, Puddle Town, uh, all stayed locally and all get a mention in the trumpet major, even if the Duke of York only sneaks in because that is the pub where Festus drinks. <laughs> uh, we've also got um, uh, did Hardy ever create a funnier character in some ways he's even funnier than fun stuff uh, we've got the comical scenes are okay I suppose but the pathos arising from that final paragraph is what I think of most when I remember the novel the stumping footfalls as the miller's son left for the last time and joined the others in the lane, given the miller's love for his sons, is a central theme. It's as powerful a, a final paragraph of a book as the woodlanders, which is saying something. We've also got, it is the hardy story I return to over and over and over. I can't quite put my finger on why, but I find it a warm and comforting book. And there's... Um, I've already found that person. John Loveday ranks as a stoic hero only a shade below Giles with the Warren and Gabriel Oak in commas, and Bob is not far behind. So I thought that was interesting. Actually, there are instances of him standing along, standing aside, which even Gabriel would have hesitated over. <laughs> uh, and it goes on about the comical irony and about Matilda. Uh, we had a lovely conversation about Matilda because a lady um, asked, "We are never, we are never told where Matilda has come from and what her story is. Only that she's an actress. It's never alluded to." And I came back and said, actress is a euphemism for women who sometimes provided help to soldiers in other ways. And um, that wasn't the answer she was expecting. <laughs> um, and then uh, we've got Hephaestus as the perfect antithesis to the love days. And I love it, though my, f my hardy favourites are a pair of blue eyes and two on a tower. Now, I thought that was interesting, because if there was ever a minor novel, that would be in the running for it. <laughs> the Trumpet Major is very easy to read. It's not overly long-winded. Quite delightful. And then we've got somebody who said, I love it. It was the first Hardy novel I read at school, and it set me off in a lifelong love of novels, and later joined the Society as a life member. And it also helped me forward to a career in agriculture, as I was so impressed by his images of rural life. Many of them said it was an O-level text, which, of course, these days, that text would be Jude or Tess, and you would never read Hardy ever again. But apparently, it was an O-level text. Yes, it was. I taught it years ago. Yes. And it encouraged mm. people to read it. Yeah. And so I'd like to finish off with... I noticed Richard had some notes, uh, Tony had some notes... Is there anything in particular you and Faisal would like to say about this novel at all? Well, uh, Richard, uh, can I, can I, just, I just say that it's very, very good that we focused on it today. And actually, uh, uh, my, I've read it, I think, four times. Um, I think my estimation of it has gradually increased. I began, I think, the first time I read it, I didn't really enjoy it all that much, but my estimation has increased. But we've got some hard work to do if we want to really raise it uh, as a, you know, a major novel. Um, I mean, Claire Tomalin, for example, calls it a pot boiler <laughs> for children. You know, I mean, that's pretty... Pretty grim, isn't it, really? It's like Jane Austen's novel run out of control slightly, yeah. Similar kind of thing. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to kind of, you know, get it off the ground. And things like what you said... It's but... interesting, because when I am in schools and, and this subject often comes up, why aren't you reading Hardy? It, 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 as, as we did in the 60s and in the 70s, particularly when it was a prescribed book. And, and others were. Not, that's not the only one. Um, 
it, it, it's not surprising that you get the answer that I do, but at the same time, it is rather infuriating. I had one answer from a head of English saying, it, it, he's a miserable old something unsavory. Straight. It's in other words, it's pessimistic. It, 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 there isn't any joy in it. Another one said he's dense, difficult to read. They say the same about Dickens and about all loose baggy monsters of the 19th century. Uh, they, th- another one said it, they really are sad works. I don't want to engulf my students with sadness. And of course, to a large extent, one of the answers I give is first and foremost, that's, these are all very stupid uh, reasons, but I wouldn't say that to a teacher, obviously. But more significantly, why don't you start with the trumpet major? Because if you start with that one, there is enough in it that allows role play among students, that allows uh, imitative writing amongst them, create your own scene, that allows them to re, re, rejig it, and so on, and of course, response to characters and response to history. And you can laugh at a lot of people in it. Therefore, it's not a miserable uh, work in the way that you see it. And furthermore, other works by Hardy are not miserable. They're about character flow. They're about people who make mistakes mm-hmm. and, and consequently life goes awry. You, you don't have to shed a tear over it. You can smile in the way Austin does, in the way Eliot does, and you can laugh in the way Dickens does because that's life. Yes. And I would very much like to see Hardy come back into the curriculum very, very, very strongly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Tony, would you like to finish us off? Okay, um, well, there are a couple, a couple of things I was thinking. I mean, one, something that hasn't been particularly mentioned, is there are a lot of lovely passages of description of the countryside, yeah, yeah. or yeah. the passage, like where they're preparing for the wedding, and, and the yeah. passage about the, all, all, all the creatures that, are, that have rotted away, and, you know, the, the attrition of things being worn down. I mean, that, that is so typical of Hardy. And sometimes they're just single sentences about the sunrise or the flowers. There's a lot of that in there, which, which tends to get passed over. The, the, the other thing which is not perhaps a very clever point, I just sometimes wonder why he called it the trumpet major. <laughs> um, it, it, it's a bit atypical of, of, of his titles because is it that much the story of the trumpet major? I, I, I'm not sure. It's the story of a lot of other things as well. But um, I think it is a book that, that grows on people and I quite agree with Faisal. It's an easy one to read and I think, I know you're very fond of Far From the Madding Crowd, but sometimes one gets the impression that he was trying to fill things for serial publication, so he turned out enough words. And also, I think with that, Leslie Stephen was making produce all these lists of, you know, the stars and all the other things and books and things because people in towns wanted to read about the countryside, which obviously served its purpose. And, and, and this fits somewhere in between. It's, it, it's not so dense as that. Yeah. Uh, okay, when, when you're finished, I have... Are you finished? Or? I, I, I was just going to say thank you so much, everybody, for coming, for bearing with us, for still being awake. Uh, for putting up with the conditions that you have. I'm very grateful to you all. Thank you to all our presenters and speakers and our musicians. And thank you, everybody, for everything and for making this actually happen in the face of adversity. I, I, I mean, I, I think what needs to be said, and you need to be reminded, that these study days originally were, were Trace's idea, and uh, this is now the... Third one, that's fourth, is it? Fourth one, sorry. And um, they've been a tremendous success. And, I mean, what, what's been nice of them, uh, ab- about them is that they've been a little bit less formal than the conferences and they've been a lot cheaper and, and they've brought out a lot, lot, lot of different people. I and mean, if it wasn't for Tracy's interest and energy, this wouldn't have happened. And particularly on this occasion, in the face of all the adversity of COVID and all that stuff. So I think a tremendous vote of thanks is owed to Tracy for this. Without her, this would And finally, can I just remind you that we do have our AGM in um, about half an hour here. And if some of you who are members of the society would like to stay, it would be appreciated. But (laughs) I can't say more than that.